Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe to the RSS feed, and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. I've never really thought of Jason as subversive, but I just found out that's what Wall Street considers him to be. Really? Now, how is that possible at all? Simple. Wall Street believes that real estate investors are dangerous to their schemes because the dirty truth about income property is that it actually works in real life. I know. I mean, how many people do you know, not including insiders, who created wealth with stocks, bonds, and mutual funds? Those options are for people who only want to pretend they're getting ahead. Stocks and other non-direct traded assets are a losing game for most people. The typical scenario is you make a little, you lose a little, and spin your wheels for decades. That's because the corporate crooks running the stock and bond investing game will always see to it that they win. This means, unless you're one of them, you will not win. And unluckily for Wall Street, Jason has a unique ability to make the everyday person understand investing the way it should be. He shows them a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Yep, and that's why Jason offers a one-book set on creating wealth that comes with 20 digital download audios. He shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches you how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. And this set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered for only $197. To get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia Book 1, complete with over 20 hours of audio, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. My pleasure to welcome Alex Haddock to the show. He is the founder of Palladium Education, and he had quite a good run in the world of podcasting. And that's what we wanted to talk to him about today. But let's also get a little bit of background on what he does for a living and how podcasting came about for him. Alex, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Good, good. My pleasure. Now, where are you located? I'm actually located in Los Angeles. Okay, great. Well, that's where I grew up, West LA. <laughs> Small world. So tell us about Palladium Education and how, how you came about to be a podcaster. Well, I, I've always been interested in personal protection and security, and it stems from my, my background and my upbringing. My father was a psychiatrist for the criminal justice system. He worked with the criminally insane in the federal prison system. So we grew up in a highly secure environment because of the, you know, his patients. Right. right. They, they would come and look for you. <laughs> okay. Yes. We would get tele threatening telephone calls in the middle of the night while my duty and you know, all sorts of different types of things. So I grew up in a very early age understanding the threat posed by the criminal element. And so it was just this lifestyle. You know, we never let it get in our way. We were always raised to be aware and take the appropriate steps to avoid trouble. And so it kind of became my business 
really liked sharing that information with other people, helping them protect themselves. Of course, I've been you know, a martial artist since I was 10 years old. Grew up with uh, military and law enforcement for friends and got amazing training. And eventually, it just, uh, just became a, a way of my business as well as a way of life. So I assume your story, and just correct me where I'm wrong, but I assume you were in your business with Palladium and you were doing your thing. When did you add podcasting to the mix? I, I think I posted my first podcast in August of 2007. I decided to, to do podcasting because I had been a corporate spokesperson for Semantic for a number of years. I had a lot of experience with public relations. And one of my favorite things to do was radio shows. I loved being on the radio. I don't know what it is about the audio system, but I just I loved it. I've been on national TV. I've been on Good Morning America, Fox News. I did press tours, but I was always drawn to radio. So uh, podcasting became about, I knew about it and thought, you know, I could do that. And so I started up podcasting as a way to market my seminars. And so your seminars, were they all local in the LA area? Yeah, and that was kind of an interesting thing that I discovered quite quickly is that podcasting is national and international. doesn't mean you have a whole lot of people in your local area to actually come to your seminars. So so you started as a way to to market your seminars, and that was your monetization strategy. But then you obviously discovered that you probably had listeners all over the world that were interested in your content and your education and so forth. What did you do next? Did you create new monetization strategies or... No, actually, I just started building my brand. I didn't jump into the monetization until uh, much later, actually years later, through the use of my book. I had always planned on doing a book and doing DVDs and, and selling, you know, creating content that people could purchase that would be available on a national level. Doing it part-time and for fun, it just took a long time to get there. Right, right. How many episodes do you have? I have, I think I just put up my 214th episode. Wow, okay, you've got a lot. Yeah, good, congratulations. Can you give us some stats in terms of your listenership and kind of how it evolved? Were you tracking downloads from the beginning of your shows? Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. And uh, which system did you use? To, did you use FeedBurner or how, how do you do it? The RSS feed and file host that I used is Libsyn, L-I-B-S-Y-N, and a big player and they had really good system with you know unlimited storage unlimited bandwidth for just a few dollars a month their prices have gone up since then and they had a good tracking system so i was able to get you know statistics updated every hour or so on the number of downloads i had and it, it was you know podcasting is the long game it's a soft sell and it takes a long time to build up I think in the first month, I think I had 100 downloads, and probably 50 of those were me. And, <laughs> and, and in that first month, I mean, how many episodes was that? Two. I, this kind of evolved over time as I figured out how to really uh, engage the audience. I, because of everything I was working on, I was so busy, I started out posting the show every other week, like twice a month. I figured, you know, I was getting a lot of feedback saying, hey, we'd like to hear you more often. But I was like, wow, how do I do the time? Because it's, you know, it takes for every episode that you post, the amount of time of the finished product, it takes five to seven times of that in production time. And let's talk about that production time for just a moment, if, if we can. So are you editing your shows or are you doing what many podcasters do? Just you record the audio file and you literally just post it. I assume you use WordPress. No, actually I don't. Oh, okay. But I, I do do absolutely everything myself. I record it using uh, Soundtrack Pro. I do all the editing there. So you do edit yours? Oh, absolutely. Okay, great, good. <laughs> I like that. Boy, if you knew how many mistakes I've made during recording, it wouldn't be funny. So no, I, I absolutely I edit it, I clean it up, and I, I post the show. I upload it to, to Libsyn, fill out the forms to put in all the metadata around it, and hit post, and then it goes out, and, and it goes out to iTunes and everything else. Oh, so Libsyn isn't an add-on service. That is your whole service that does your podcast syndication and everything, huh? Yes. Okay, great. All the RSS, the file hosting, file serving, statistics, the whole thing. Okay, fantastic. Okay, tell us more. So you were saying you posted one show every two weeks. Right, and, and I was getting a lot of feedback that people wanted to have it more often, but the challenge I had was, was time because there is so much time involved in it. So I came up with the idea of doing a quick tip every other episode, a quick five-minute show, and then follow it up on the, and every other week with a full long episode. How long is long? For me, it's if I do it, if it's just me talking, it's about twenty minutes. If I have an interview, it's about an hour. So, so you have you do your format is guest interviews and just monologue. So when you do it, it's about twenty minutes, but when you do a guest, it's it's about an hour, right? 
Right. Okay, great. And the whole focus and the structure of it, and I have a master's in education, and the whole focus and structure of it is an education program. It really is about teaching people how to protect themselves and how to maintain a safe, easy, consistent lifestyle without being paranoid, acting paranoid, or, or being too worried about things. Little things that you can change in your lifestyle that will make you significantly safer as you walk around in the home. And that was significant because I saw a huge increase in the number of downloads beyond, you know, you'd think it would just double because I'm doing the double amount of episodes. It went up by six times. Hmm. And how often were you posting at, at this point when you, when you saw the six times growth? That's when I moved to once a week. Okay. I really think that's a, that's a minimum for, for shows is once a week. Because people like that consistency. They don't want to have to find it. The other thing I found is that it needs to be a consistent day. You need to post on Sundays or Mondays or Tuesdays, someplace that they know they can go out and get it and look for it on a regular basis. If I am really busy and I, I miss an upload, you know, my, my numbers are down significantly more than just you would think just for that single episode. So consistency is really, really crucial in podcasting. Yeah, you know, I used to always say when I taught marketing seminars to the real estate industry years ago, they, they always have the thing, well, I want to be different. I want to be unique. And I, I, my famous quote was, if you want to be unique, if you want to be different, just be consistent because that's very unique. <laughs> Very, very few of your competitors are consistent about things. The boring drudgery of consistency is uniqueness in and of itself. The other thing is you really have to have at least 10 shows or maybe even 20 to be considered a player. Yeah. Because there's so many people think, oh, yeah, I could do that. I'll buy a phone and I'll go out and I get some free recording software, throw up a couple of shows and it'll be easy and it'll be fun. And yes, it's easy and fun in the beginning, but after a while it, it becomes a task and really have to be into it. You really have to enjoy it in order to make it beyond those 10, 15 episodes. That's why a lot of, a lot of these, uh, the networks and the groups won't even look at you unless you've had 15 episodes posted. And I find that a lot of podcasters starting out, their big question is, what will I talk about? But then once they start and once they get it going, they come up with a million ideas for new episodes and new content. And any thoughts on that? Well, the good ones do. A lot of shows that peter out because people lose ideas and they don't know how to, to branch out and how to be creative. I, I admit, I was worried that after a year I'd run out of ideas. And I'm hitting five years now. I have so much content backed up that, that I need to do that I just don't have time to research and, and script that it, it's crazy. And plus, now that I'm established, I have users sending me questions and asking me to cover certain material or offering their own stories for analysis. So it, it, it gets easier with time really have to have a passion for it and a passion for the content. Right, right. And I do, and I sense that you do as well in, in your shows. So statistics on downloads. First month, 100. You jokingly say you were 50 of them probably. And that was just two episodes. Then you increased your number of episodes. You did the quick tips. And the ratings started really, really increasing. What kind of numbers were you looking at? You know, still in the beginning, but maybe for several months. Do you remember? Boy, we're five years ago now. I, I remember it took me about a year to break a thousand downloads in the first week of the show. So, for example, what we do is because it's it's very hard to track who your subscribers are because the RSS system is not really set up for that. So the, the rule of thumb is when you post a new show, the number of downloads you get for that new show in the first week are your hardcore subscribers. And it took me a year and I got about 1,000. I was up to 1,000. After two years, I was up to 2,000. And, and at that point, and, and the 1,000 also was another, was at least back in the time then, things have changed a little bit for podcasting. But 1,000 is when it really started to take on its own life. And it really started to just kind of snowball and, and really start to build once I had established that number. That seemed to be the, the, the rollover point. That's what I love about podcasting is that once you get it going, it's like that flywheel of business. It starts to just snowball and really, really work with very little maintenance after a certain amount of time because you've got that subscriber base. And as long as you keep providing valuable content, it's pretty easy to maintain. And, and that's what I... I get concerned about new podcasters just giving up way too early. That's true in sales. It's true in athletics, true in martial arts, I'm sure. But once, once you get that flywheel moving, you know, things really start to, you know, you start to grease the skids, don't you? And, and things start to happen in a much easier fashion with lower effort, don't they? 
Oh, absolutely. And that, that's why I say podcasting is a long game and it's a soft sell because, and soft sells are extremely powerful, but a long time to build. But once they build, they are your base, this loyal, loyal fan base. And they really, they help you out. You know, all of the costs for my show are covered by listener donations. So just strictly donations, huh? Yeah, that covers all my costs. My costs are pretty low because I think myself, I don't, I don't, pay anybody to do anything. I've got all the skills. I could do it myself. And the cost of the website and the RSS feed and things like that, or, or I keep it you know, to a minimum. But I don't even advertise. I mean, I have a donate button on my podcast page and through the Gun Rights Radio Network. I'm a member of the Gun Rights Radio Network and they have a donation area. I don't even mention on my show, but people send me money. Do you, do you care to share how much in terms of donations? It's a few hundred dollars a year. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, so, so it's not a big amount, but again, the cost is very low too. So you're covering the cost there, but then you have a whole business that is benefiting from the content you put out there, right? Absolutely. And it also helps uh, sell it to your spouse. Who You're spending all this time and money. Does it cost you anything? No, no, everything's covered. It doesn't cost us anything. We're like, Okay, good. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and so uh, in, in terms of the statistics, so second year, 2,000 listeners or 2,000 downloads on each episode? Yes. And what happened after that? That I kind of flattened out at that point. And I was equivalent to the largest and most popular martial arts podcast. So I'd hit the peak of, of just the pure martial arts group. And then I was approached by the Gun Rights Radio Network. And I was a little wary in the beginning. And I, I checked them out. And they had really good content and really good shows. And they had a couple of huge names in the industries uh, working with them. The, the biggest one being Masada Ayub. So I, I joined their network. And within two months, I had doubled my listenership. So you were just – now, do you produce only one actual show – Right now, yes. I have plans to release a second show by the end of the year. So you, what you did then, let's talk a little bit about that. That's really interesting, Alex. So you were publishing your show. You were building an audience, building a subscriber base and a following, or as Seth Godin would say, your tribe. And then you were approached by a podcasting network, and you lended your show to their network. How did that work? Yes, it's, it's, um, it doesn't cost me anything. So there's no fees. It's just basically a, a group of like-minded podcasters that collaborate and have a central location to talk about their shows and share their shows and cross-promote their shows to broaden the audience. And they are just a fantastic group of guys. I've made some lifelong friends by joining the network. And, you know, when somebody has a book come out or a seminar, you know, everyone helps promote it across the different shows. Uh, they mention it, you know, we guest on each other's show to share information and it's, it's really a mutually beneficial arrangement because it, everyone, it, it allows a lot of cross pollination. And, and how many different shows or hosts are in the gun rights radio network? I think they have 15 to 20. So, so you're all cross promoting and helping each other out and guesting on each other's shows. So that's great. Did you have to pay anything to be involved, or did they pay you, or was that? It, it's just like a co-op, I assume, right? It's like a co-op. It's like a co-op. Uh, uh, yeah, there's there's no payment, and some networks, you know, charge you a fee to be on their network and things like that. I would I would never do that, simply because the expectations are different, and it makes it a business relationship. Whereas all the podcasters in the Gun Rights Radio Network really consider each other friends and colleagues, and so it's a very fun exciting group of guys that, you know, when we're in town, we go and we meet together in person and they're scattered all over the country and at the various conferences, everyone gets together. It's just a lot of fun and it helps each other out. Everyone's very, very willing to help, help other members out. Yeah, that, that's great. So the, so the network thing is great. Now, in terms of the network, in terms of what that did for you joining a network, was it strictly that your your shows are now showing up on their website and you're guesting and hosting on each other's shows or was there more to it? Did they do any promotion for you or, or anything like that other than those things that I mentioned? No, it's just those things. Just yeah, okay. it's cross promotion. We, we all share a, a, a general message board uh, where everyone's shows are posted and everyone can join the discussions and the message forums and the joint forums and uh, no, it's just it's just about this guy's a, now a member of the family and, you know, let's help promote a show. And everyone sends out messages. Hey, yeah, I got this going on. Can you guys help me out and, and talk about a show? I'm like, sure. Sometimes, you know, what I did for when my book came out, I recorded a 30-second uh, segment, a little spot for it. 
and then send it out to the guys. And they all ran it on their shows for several weeks to help promote the book. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. So what are your, let's fast forward to today, what are your download statistics looking like? I don't want to get into too much specific, but I, I get tens of thousands of downloads now. And on each episode? Thousands of each episode, tens of thousands on a monthly basis. Okay, great, fantastic. And I've broken 1.4 million total downloads. Fantastic. And in iTunes, the show is generally in the top 10, and I've been as high as number two several times in the education and training section. Now, is that in that section, or is it in that section under certain search terms? It's in that section. So if you go to iTunes, you go podcasts, education, training, you look at the top 10 list there, I'm usually floating around in there. Fantastic. Oh, yeah, and, and I, like I said, I've been as high as number two. Number one is, is held by, oh, Adam something or other who's doing a he's a you know tv guy comedian he used to do apparently he used to do construction so he's got a construction podcast so he 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 owns that spot and there's no one no no amateur is going to be able to uh to bump him out of that right right so now are you are your uh, podcast all audio or have you considered video at all as well i've done video a couple of times but primarily it is exclusively audio uh, just because of the the time the setup the editing production quality it goes up significantly when you move to video so i because of my time constraints uh, i focus primarily on audio you know and frankly i i have to just say I personally like audio better because I just don't have enough time to sit at my computer and watch videos. Audio is portable. It is such a great medium. And and oddly enough, like radio nowadays is just good old-fashioned terrestrial radio has overshadowed TV in some, in some categories because the portability. I mean, the portability is very, very significant, I think, for the listener, for the audience. Oh, absolutely. Uh, people listen to my show while they're driving, which I'm okay with, but people also listen to my show like when they're working out or when they're hiking or walking. And, and I, I hear that all the time on my shows, that people, you know, that I'm, I'm their gym show. And I said, well, gosh, I, I don't think it's a very motivating workout, but <laughs> probably music would be better. <laughs> yeah. I, I, but my problem, though, is I really don't like people listening to my show when they're out for a walk or a hike because I really want them paying attention to their environment. I've actually done shows as if you're listening to this while you're walking, Turn me off, you know. Well, that's a good point, yeah, because you're, you're a safety and security guy, so that's, that's kind of an irony. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. Has your show, Alex, just grown strictly organically, or have you ever tried advertising or, like, pushing the growth of the show at all? Because I have a couple of times, but I find that it's just pretty much, for me, been an organic process. That's what actually works. I would love to just be able to grow it faster by throwing some some money at it, frankly, but I don't know. I don't hear too much about podcasters doing that. It seems fairly organic to me. Absolutely. Mine has been a purely organic growth, which is why I think it's been slow. But then again, I'm, I'm fine with slow because it's, it's solid. When I released my book, which is a Practical Home Security, A Guide to Safer Urban Living, people bought it. Although they had already heard the content, they, they bought the books anyway just to show support for the show and, and to give out to friends and relatives. So again, slow, soft sell is, you know, creates a, a real loyal base. So, and, and I found that I have not been able to successfully pay for any advertising ever. So I'm, 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 my selection in advertising that I've spent money on in the past has always been bad and I've never seen a good return on it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would have to agree with you. The podcast advertising, it's just, it's pretty much an organic world. It really is. Plus, I mean, you can't make money off the podcast itself. It's, a, it's about the secondary options. It's about the books. It's about the seminars. It's, it's about speaking tours, things like that, that you make the money from. You don't make money directly from the podcasting. Only, the only people that make money off advertising on their shows 
are people that have already had established radio shows or TV shows that then move into podcasting. But making pod, I mean, for the amateur, making money and getting actual advertisers to pay to be on your show is really not going to happen. Yeah, yeah. So that's more like the Adam Carolla type category that you're talking about there, where you can really actually sell advertising and monetize directly that way. But secondary monetization is is very, very lucrative. So, so tell us what you've done. I mean, you were a guy hosting these seminars in the LA area. Then you started podcasting. You had a national, if not a global audience after that. And what were some of your secondary products or services that you were able to gain business for on the podcast? Well, primarily it's been my book and, and selling the book, which has become, I think, and I think it's primarily because the podcast has exceeded all of my expectations in terms of being able to, to monetize it. And part of the reason is, and I think this is going to be very interesting to your audience, is that if you're a writer, I think podcasting is perfect for you. If you do seminars, I think podcasting is perfect for you because what, what you can do is you can recycle your content. This is what I did and what I will be doing from, for, for the foreseeable future. And, and so tell us about recycling your content. One, one of the things I really believe in is create the content once and repurpose it as many ways as possible. Yes, so I'm not. So it has yeah. scale to it. But how, how should a writer do that specifically? Like some of the things I do, I'll just share, and maybe these are the same things. I'll have some of my written content voiced by professional voiceover people. And I'll then play that on the podcast. But you can go both directions. You can also pay to have your podcast transcribed and turn that audio content into blog post type content on your website, which increases your search engine visibility. So, you know, it goes both ways, doesn't it? Absolutely. What I've done and what I'm, what I'm doing now with, with products that I'm going to be releasing from the summer on towards the end of the year was going to be my big, my big push for having availability is that the scripts and the research and the notes that I've taken for my podcasts, I took all that and then I put that into a book. And because the podcast was mine and because I self-published, I maintained control and copyright of my intellectual property. I then also have a column in Taekwondo Times Magazine. And again, the same notes that I, that I wrote and built for the podcast, I recycle into a column for Taekwondo Times. When I negotiate my contract with Taekwondo Times, I maintained the copyright. So I still own everything that I produce. And so I can take that and recycle it. And again, with the, with the individual publishing, the self-publishing, you know, with a traditional model, you give up a lot of those rights. But with self-publishing, you can maintain them. Great, great point, great point. There's an old cliche, and it's a term everybody's heard. The phrase is writer's block. And for a lot of writers, I think one of the other great things about podcasting is we've all heard of writer's block, but we haven't probably heard of talker's block, have we? <laughs> and, and so if you've got an idea for a book, for example, you know, you want to write the great American novel or even better, a nonfiction type of work or business or whatever it is, just start doing a podcast and start talking about it. And as you start talking about it, the best way to learn something many times is to actually teach it first. Oddly enough, as crazy as that sounds. And, and, and once you start talking about it, the ideas start to gel. They start to take on a form. They start to create new ideas and new, you know, that sort of that mind map just expands where there's so many branches to that tree. We've all seen mind maps usually. We know what a mind map is. And one of the ways to increase the size of the mind map, I think, is to just start talking about it. And if, if you don't know what to say and you think and you, you do have talker's block and maybe then that means you shouldn't do it in a monologue format. You should just interview like-minded people and have guests on your shows. And I, don't you think, Alex, that's just a great way to start writing? Well, absolutely. But you need to be careful with the whole copyright issue. It, it's different when it's an education program, which is what, what I do. But when you're talking about a novel and stories, you know, somebody could take that and could jump the gun on you. Well, that's true. It, yeah. It's very, it's very different with, with an education program or seminars or, or things like that. But um, Well, why, why don't you think someone can take that and jump the gun on you? I mean, what, what's the difference in your eyes? Well, the difference is credibility. Because with the podcast, with the books, with all the other material, you're seen as the expert. So if some random Joe Schmo takes that material and starts talking about it, they're not going to get the audience. They don't have the, the established credibility. They're not the go-to guy for that. And so they'll probably, it'll, the loss is minimal. But when it comes to a novel, 
somebody can take that idea that 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 germ of a story and then develop it on their own and there's a much i think there's a better opportunity for that that idea to be to be stolen yeah okay good point good point i see what you mean so maybe on the on the novel idea you know if you're a storyteller then record but don't publish <laughs> even just do that yeah. to get, start talking and just help you can help gel your ideas that way so yeah yeah good, good or things. or do book readings for free at the public library or something like that some not international audience right <laughs> very good point fair enough fair enough any other things that you want to mention to people alex just kind of in wrapping up about podcasting and and why they should do it or how they should do it oh wow yeah there's there's a lot more stuff yeah one of the the strengths i think of podcasting is that you build a relationship with the audience, with your listeners, with, with your followers. Yeah. Followers is a, I don't like to say followers. It's probably a bad word to use, but I mean the, the people that, that track you and listen to you and will, will buy your things because instead of being real stuffy about it, you need to be friendly because after our time, if these people listen, listen to your show a lot, it's like listen, having lunch with an old friend. And I get lots of emails from, from listeners that say, you know, I feel like I know you. And so some of the emails I get are a little too personal and overshare in some cases. And it's, it's really interesting. And then when they purchased my book and they read the book, they said it was really nice because they could actually put my voice into the book as they were reading it because they heard me for so many hours. And I've had people come to my seminars and were like, I must be in the right place. I know that voice because they've never met me in person. And of course, you never look like, like what your pictures are in your life. So it, it really builds this this personal relationship with the, with everyone. And the tie-ins with Facebook and Twitter can be pretty powerful as well. Tell us about that. What you can do is it's a way to interact directly with the users and the listeners beyond just email. Uh, I get lots of email and I, I don't get a chance to actually respond to all the email. But the, the, the listeners can answer their own questions and provide their own input and with my subject, it's really interesting because I have listeners that are like literally, literally 10-year-old girls up to 20-year military veterans. There's a huge swath. And so I've got a lot of, you know, law, I get emails all the time from law enforcement officers saying, yeah, that's a great idea. Here's my experience with it. You know, this really helped me. I get emails from people saying I saved their lives and I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about that. Yeah, great but, testimonials. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. And so there's a lot of fulfillment with it because you get direct interaction with people and it's also scary in a way because you are affecting other people's lives. So you really have to have your stuff together and in line and correct because you know with an education program like mine, people are going out and doing what I'm saying. And it's a huge responsibility that I get it right so people don't put themselves in more danger than they were in before. So there's a lot of responsibility. But with the Facebook and Twitter, you can interact with them. You can adjust answers because sometimes I get emails from people and they've just completely missed the point on what I said. So it allows me to steer them in the right direction. And Facebook is a great way of doing that. People get to share their own experiences. They have years of experiences and different opinions that are absolutely valid and important. And it's a great place to share. But with Twitter and Facebook, you have to give them a reason to come there. And so what I do is I try and post a daily tip to Facebook and Twitter and share articles. Because if it's just announcing the latest shows up, people aren't going to be there. But if you have something of value in addition to the show – additional interactions, additional information, additional insight. It can help significantly with the show and enhancing the dimensionality of the show. It certainly can. And one of the other great things is with Facebook and Twitter, you can set it up so that your RSS feeds, whenever you publish a new show, they automatically upload to your page or your Twitter feed. And that's a great thing. The other thing is listener feedback and listener questions, which you had alluded to, but maybe you didn't say it exactly the same way I'm saying it. We, we use our Facebook page a lot to get listeners to post questions there rather than emailing them one by one where they're they're sort of hard to keep track of and you've got to find them all before the show that you want to record. And then you can answer them live on the show rather than having to answer them directly on the page. So, you know, it can save you a lot of typing and also produce content for your shows, right? Absolutely. Uh, and in fact, uh, I had a, recently had a show, uh, a guest on for a couple of shows 
uh, Doc Wesson, who actually is a, a chemist for he's a he's an independent contractor, but he works with the government, various agencies, and he, he works on Kevlar. And so we had two wonderful, wonderful, wonderful shows talking about Kevlar and uh, Kevlar meaning body armor, right? Yes, yeah. yes, uh, bullet resistance vests and things like that. And there was such a huge response to that. We brought him back for a third show, and we just essentially collected all the questions that had been posted to the Gun Rights Radio Network forum, the Facebook page personal emails, and we spent, you know, 30 minutes just answering those questions on another show. Fantastic. So there's just like this endless supply of content, isn't there? There is if if you have a good topic. You need to have a, a fairly broad topic. If you get too narrow, then you you run into a problem in that you can't branch out from that. So you need to have something that has a, a fairly – is focused, yet you can do a lot with it. What about preparation? I mean – some podcasters and radio show hosts, I find that they prepare a lot, and some don't prepare. They just sort of ad-lib it. And, you know, some people are really good with preparation. Some people actually sound better ad-libbing a bit. What are your thoughts? How do you do it? Well, I, I, for me, I tried several different ways. I tried scripting it exactly and reading word for word. And without proper training, without public relations training, that makes it very, very difficult because it sounds scripted. It sounds like somebody's reading it. And that's not interesting to people. It's like somebody giving a presentation and going up and just reading their notes from a presentation rather than just speaking to the audience. I tried shows where I just went completely off the cuff. I had a topic and I went off the cuff. And I found that I rambled quite a bit. And that when I just, I gave myself some good notes, I went through and, and built an outline. I basically made a speech that I covered the exact same material in half the amount of time. And it was clearer, more concise, and easier to understand. So I'm a big advocate of of making notes and following a plan because you have to have a pro- progression of thought. You know, Otherwise, you're just bouncing all around. Now, some people just bounce around. And I find it distracting and annoying, and, and there's, uh, there's a lot of waste of time. I like to keep my shows very concise. That's, that's part of my personality. My writing is very concise. The, the podcasts are very concise. And people like that because they can go in, they can get the information, and they can leave. It's efficient. And there are different kinds of shows on that. And oddly enough, I get impatient listening to other people's shows, too, where they're just sort of rambling on and on. But, you know, some of those are popular. Like, there's a show called No Agenda that's pretty big, I hear. And uh, I <laughs> yes, tried I'm listening to it once, and it was, it was so long, I just didn't have time. But, you know, different strokes for different folks, I guess. Well, hey, give out your website, Alex, and just share any closing thoughts you have. Sure. The business website is palladium-education.com. And palladium is P-A-L-L-A-D-I-U-M. And a lot of people ask what that is. And it's actually a statue from ancient Greece, part of uh, ancient folklore and mythology, that was the city protector of Troy and Athens. It's the statue of Pallas Athena. So it's the palladium. There's also a mineral called palladium, which I think is found in Russia. It's a it's sort of like platinum, but that's, that's not what our, that's why we have the statue of, the, of Pals Athena as, as our logo. And then my personal website where I do most of my seminar training is alexhaddocks.com. It's, it's real tough. Fantastic. And Alex, we want to have you on my other show, The Holistic Survival Show, to talk about your actual expertise in your content area. So we will do that at a future time. But thank you so much for sharing these great thoughts with fellow podcasters today. And I think that you've had some great advice, great experience, and congratulations on your success. Thank you. I really appreciate being on the show. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. Please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.